Hey, this is Mike Mosh at Cad Wallet, or thanks for dialing in to Fund Finance Friday Industry Conversations. As we've gotten into June and the market has really stabilized a fair bit, we've changed the format a bit this week. We've added video and we're including a number of short segments from a variety of contributors, both within Cadwallader and from the greater fund finance community. Our hope is to increase the volume and breadth of information that industry conversations is able to get out into the market, but in largely the same window of time. So with that, Cadwallader's hair and makeup team flew down to Charlotte. Uh, I put on khakis like Jake from State Farm for the first time in three months, and here we are. Really appreciate you, uh, you joining us today. To start, I thought I'd give a little bit of information on what our fund finance practice at Cadwallader has seen so far in May. This is data from our US practice. So the first slide steps back and looks at 2020 compared to 2018 and 2019. And I, I just thought this slide was interesting because it sort of looks like absolutely nothing has changed. Uh, this is clearly the slide that I'm going to show to my management. The, uh, the next slide breaks that down a little bit though, and looks at our billable hours accrued here for the first four months or the, the last four months. Uh, and it's really interesting. You can see the massive surge uh, that happened in March and that was predicted. You know, in March, we had a lot of demand forward when the disruption first hit and a lot of April and May deals kind of really accelerated trying to close as soon as possible and every fund hit its, hit, hit its accordion in March and uh, exercised its increase, etc. Uh, so March was clearly busy. However, you know, if you look at May, it's really hung in there, you know, really darn well. And the next slide gets a little bit more granular with that. You know, if you, if you look at May, uh, backdated, you know, our May hours still exceed our trailing 12 month average. And if you look at our perspective time over on the right hand side of the slide, you can see May actually ticked up pretty nicely, uh, which projects pretty well for the summer. The next slide uh, shows, it's just interesting to me. So I focus a lot on our forward indicators, one of which is how many LPAs we read in a month. And I like this slide because, and it, it makes perfect sense, but it demonstrates the correlation between our trailing three month billable hour data uh, and the number of LPAs we review. So anytime we see an uptick in LPAs, it's highly correlated with the trailing three month uptick in our billable hours. And so knowing that, uh, we keep up with how many LPAs we review. And, and if you notice in, uh, in May, as well as in March and in April, those numbers did come down a little bit, which certainly suggests that over the course of the summer, we could see some moderation in our subscription facility volume. But a little bit, this begged the question for me, you know, how are our May prospective hours up so much, even though our LPA account was down a little bit? Uh, and I don't know the answer uh, for sure at this point, but I've got a theory, and that theory is, a lot of the prospective work that we did in May was on NAV oriented facilities. And those facilities don't tend to start with a request for an LPA review. Uh, so to be determined if that's correct, uh, but that's my theory that you know, prospective NAV facilities really ticked up a fair amount in May, uh, which leads to the discrepancy between the, the increase in our prospective hours and the LPA count. Before we get started, I would like to give a shout out to the Cadwallader Fund Finance Associates. You know, when that uptick hit in March and they converted to work from home, uh, they all just really, really stepped up. It was a massive influx of work at a challenging time, as well as with some other challenges. And uh, I'm just really proud of how they all uh, stood up to support their clients and our clients and, uh, and really did a great job. As uh, the hours did come down a little bit in May, somehow they did find enough time uh, to make fun of me a little bit as, uh, as these two pictures seem to show. So uh, clearly we need the bankers to get us some more work so these associates have something productive to do. So with that backdrop, we're pleased to have with us today, Nick Mitra who is a managing director and runs the Funds Finance Business for the Americas for New Texas and is also the vice chair of the Funds Finance Association. Nick, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah, you bet. How you doing? Very good, very good. It's an interesting time where we are today. Yeah, uh, for sure, for sure, no doubt, no doubt. 
Well, you know, about three, four, five weeks ago now, there was the article uh, that came out titled LP defaults. And certainly our market had all gotten up in arms and concerned about that. And you had come up with the idea of creating the uh, Fund Finance Association sponsors call where you got everybody together and uh, you know, allowed the market to share actual information. And, and, and that really, I think, brought the market's temperature down. And I commend your leadership for getting that call together. Um, it, it really, I think, helped kind of stabilize the market. Uh, the last call we had uh, later, uh, earlier last week, you know, the market reaction seemed really, really positive. What, what are you seeing and hearing in the market now? So, so thanks, Mike. That's actually, we did that call very specifically to counteract rumors, news articles and such to make sure people understood what was really going on in our market, which was for the most part is functioned as it's supposed to and how it's been functioning for several years now. A couple of high delinquencies, but it's just nothing out of the ordinary. But we didn't want some screaming headline to distract from the message. We got a big consistency within the Fund Finance Association and the market right now. And so it helped calm that. That was exactly the intention of that. At the same time, if you remember six to eight weeks ago, a lot of banks were internally facing a lot of questions about liquidity and such. We wanted to make sure there was a rational voice out there saying, look, there could be other concerns in other parts of the bank, but as far as our market goes, it continues to function. And I think it did, it did serve that purpose very well. So as one of the persons in the call mentioned, they said, well, the first few weeks felt like the first few innings of a baseball game, and now we're in the middle innings. That's exactly what it feels like now. The initial panic has subsided, and now people are just working through what are going to be some, some real credit issues at certain banks. If you have a lot of retail exposure, aviation exposure, you're going to see you know, issues around those, those credits. But as far as our product goes, it still continues to function. Yeah, well, speaking of some of those specific issues, you know, rumor has it you've got a really large deal in the market. How is the syndication process going? Sure. So the way we look at syndication and the success of it is really run by two factors that overlay. One is the relationship aspect, as well as the deal structure and pricing and economics and such and investor base and such. So both of those have to overlap for it to be successful. Uh, you can't have a, a bank's not going to take on a, a, a poorly structured deal because the relationship is good or vice versa. So in the case that we're in the market for, the client has one of the strongest relationships on the street, with a very, very wide uh, set of banks that they work with. So we're working through that. It's not saying it isn't challenging because everything in this market is difficult. Every bank is being cautious. But given the structure of a very strong relationship, and a very strong structure with very diverse investors, institutional and quality and repeats, all the things that we look for, we're getting through it. Are you having to cast a wider net than you did pre-COVID? We are. It's also a combination of what size commitments you want. If you, if you, if you bifurcate a market beyond just the X number of banks that are in the market, certain banks play in certain spaces. There's a group of banks that likes to service smaller funds and smaller facilities. And there are others that like to go wide and others have other very specific return requirements. So within the space that fit with this particular deal, which was a broadly commingled fund with a very strong sponsor, we hit virtually everyone in that space. Okay. Great, great. Now, now, Texas has always been one of the most active banks in the hybrid space. Are you seeing any activity in that area right now? So this was this really interesting. When the market, uh, when we first went into COVID about eight or nine weeks ago, there was a huge interest in, I got many, many phone calls from NAF facilities and hybrid facilities. We looked at them. <clears throat> Hybrid facilities have always been our niche where we've syndicated these facilities. Uh, we were very cautious about them because you end up, when you're syndicating a hybrid, you end up with the lowest common denominator effect where you have to clear every single bank's credit requirements and such. So for the time being, temporarily, we pulled back from that market and restructured some of the facilities that were hybrids into stretch capital calls. And from there, we're now re-engaging now that the market is a lot calmer than eight, nine weeks ago, we're really engaging on the hybrid conversations. That's great, that's great. Do you foresee some hybrid deals getting done here in the second, early third quarter? Definitely, I mean, we've got 
we have had conversations with clients who are saying, okay, I need this amount. It's going to happen a little bit later. And that's also worked with a hybrid product because hybrids work with a lot of assets. Deal flow has slowed down to an extent. So there aren't as many assets available for the borrowing base because deal flow slowed down. So as that deal flow picks up, we will go back to seeing, uh, we expect to see more hybrids coming in. It's an inevitable consequence of banks getting comfortable lending initially in the initial phase of the product. And then what? You just kind of have a cliff or an aftercare facility is much more aftercare facility after the commitment period. So then what? This is what, that's kind of where the hybrid product fits in well. And that, that part hasn't changed. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mentioned before, at both the end of March and in April, we felt like there was a ton of demand forward activity. So I mean, you know, second quarter deals that really pulled forward into March and into April. Uh, and our deal flow during that period was just through the roof. You know, our main numbers did steady a fair bit, uh, still ahead of our rolling 12 month average, which is great, but they did back down from the April and late March approvals. What are you predicting from a pipeline perspective for the industry as we get into the third and fourth quarters of this year? So I guess there's a couple of ways to look at it. We had, uh, there's an impacts of fundraising and how it impacts our business. There's also an impact of, deal flow, the immediate deal flow, which we all felt eight weeks ago when we had a rush of extensions, amendments, and then such that came in. So we seem to have gone past that initial wave of let's extend this out by another year or another two years, or I'm going to accelerate what I was going to close in three months from now into two weeks. So we seem to have gotten through that. Now we're sort of in what I uh, kind of mentioned before, the, the long slog. Now it's working through the new deals that are coming in. What do I think? Look, our business very closely matches what happens on the primary side and the fundraising side. So what do you see in terms of fundraising? We see a lot of activity in the secondary space and a lot of activity in the special situation space. That means we will see a lot of activity in those particular areas for financing. Just one just follows the other. Uh, versus other areas such as maybe potentially real estate sites. Look, we're not as active in that particular segment. I would assume there's gonna be some, probably some slowdown, whether it's aviation or real estate or something retail related, you're gonna see some sort of slowdown over there. Um, but clearly secondary are expected to have a, a pretty strong year this year. Nick, what are you seeing in terms of credit structures? Are uh, like credit boxes at the banks tightening as a result of COVID? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's absolutely a big migration towards stick to the stick to the netting, stick to the basics, and get those deals done. So anything that was a stretch before is being pulled back. That's number one. Longer terms, three years, four years are being pulled back. Three years are getting done, but on occasion more the exception than the rule. Um, you know, banks are saying we will, you know, we've seen a significant pullback in banks doing single investor facilities, which is surprising to us. We actually thought it'd be an easier way to man manage the credit, but clearly banks are being more conservative in that space. So anything sort of out of the ordinary is taking a lot more, getting a lot more scrutiny. And we're just trying to make sure that when we're structuring these, that we can actually sell them if they're syndicating the, the facilities. Yeah, that's great. That is consistent with what we're seeing. We haven't seen very many SMAs uh, since the COVID disruption has started either, come to think about it. Yeah. yeah. Also, also, uncommitted facilities are getting done. But again, banks, because banks have the option of not funding from a borrower's perspective, what was pretty much a guaranteed funding, you get, you get more questions around that. And some borrowers are certainly saying, okay, maybe I'll structure into a committed structure because then I'll know I'll have my funding. That's also a function of relationship overlaid with deal structure and pricing. Yeah, yeah. Now, Nick, I understand that your 14-year-old daughter is a budding entrepreneur and has her own company that manufactures slime. What, what's the name of the company? Sweet Slime Studio. Excellent. Um, how, how does the slime business hold up and work from home? You, you know, you'd be surprised. It's almost a perfect balance to COVID. It was very interesting is that her sales shoot up whenever there's a stress or crisis going on. So the last time there were hurricanes that were going through the South and her sales shot up to the States that were that, that because kids use it as a form of stress relief. And, uh, 
and, and it gives them something to get them off the news headlines. And so her sales have been shooting up. It's the perfect balance to COVID. That's great. Well, we'll have to have a slime booth at the next FFA conference. <laughs> yeah. Hey, thanks for joining us, man. It's good to catch up. Thank you, Mike. Great. So we also this week wanted to get an update on what's going on with the Funds Finance Association. And Tina May of the Maples Group and a board member of the FFA was kind enough to join us. Tina, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Thanks very much for having me on today. Bet, you bet. Glad to have you. How's the weather in the Cayman Islands? Oh, well, look, I can, uh, I can flick you to a picture of the sunshine uh, there. So that's what, it, that's what it's like. But unfortunately, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm in the office. It's my new home office. So the virtual background uh, is what I typically see. But uh, it's nice and sunny at the moment. Hurricanes haven't hit us just yet. So, Tina, how are the Cayman Islands doing with the virus and how is the work from home scenario there? The work from home scenario, I think it's gone, it's gone really well. The government um, reacted really quickly to the pandemic. Our borders are closed and they're likely to remain closed until September. And the financial industry as a whole um, has, has done really well. We're generally pretty prepared anyway because of the hurricane nature of this jurisdiction so um, most people have already got the ability to simply pick up the laptop or the two in one and walk out of the door and start work from home um, and the pandemic itself whilst we've got cases locally we've had no local deaths recorded as well as um, 50 percent of the, the people who have tested positive um, have actually are completely asymptomatic so whether it's uh, the sunshine that makes it a, a lesser strand here or not, I'm not sure. But um, on the whole, I think the island is, is faring really well and the community itself is doing fantastically and supporting each other with um, community initiatives um, as well as supporting all of the local businesses. So, um, you know, we live on a Caribbean island, so we're, we're lucky generally just for that fact. But uh, outside of this, we're also very lucky and Hopefully we'll be able to open our borders and, and welcome people back to the islands from sort of September, October time. Great, great. Well, thank, thanks for being with us. A couple of uh, FFA updates for the group, if you don't mind. Uh, mm -hmm. I understand there was a WFF event last week that was well received. Give us an update on that. It was fantastic. So we had um, over 75 people in attendance from all around the globe. So we had European, Asian, North American Cayman attendees. Um, the discussion in relation to the market update was very similar to the North American market that we see and that we talk about every every fortnight with the North American team. But it was it was fantastic to see everybody. Everybody's active. Everybody's keeping extremely busy, notwithstanding the work from home environment and the, the market volatility. Um, so everything was very positive, and it was just fantastic to see everybody's smiling faces. Uh, that's great. That's great. Now you've always been really involved in the London conference. Uh, how are plans shaping up for that event now currently scheduled for the fall? Yeah, so the, uh, we're working really closely with the Landmark. They've been massively supportive on, on the current situation. Um, and as you know, we would have been in, in London next week. And now, of course, it's being rescheduled for the fall in October. At the moment, we're, taking, we're keeping a very close eye on it. Um, you know, it would be fantastic if we can go ahead with an in-person conference. But even if, um, you know, borders open and everybody's able to travel, we're not sure if people will want to at that time. And, of course, the, the safety and the sensitivities of all our members is, is what's paramount for us. So we're looking at some other opportunities, whether it's a full virtual conference or perhaps a hybrid where we might have um, a fireside chat or some panel conversations all around the same time. But um, the full board is looking at these opportunities and we're going to try and put on the best production that we can um, for, the, for the whole uh, sponsorship base. That's great. That's great. Hey, there's still some time, I assume, before formal decisions need to be made. Do you have any idea for when timing decisions on whether it's virtual or in-person will be made? We're talking about it every week, um, and uh, we're looking at different platforms and availability. So we're keeping our options open as, as much as we can for the time being. I think we're going to be making a decision maybe sort of July or August of the latest, I would say, because we obviously want to give everybody as much notice as possible so that they can contribute um, from a panel discussion to so sponsorship opportunities that we're looking at for people, and as well as all of the networking opportunities that we want to be able to offer to, to the group. So, in the next month or so, I would say I think we would have, a, have an answer as to which group we're going to go down. Yeah. 
And is Singapore in the same boat? Absolutely. It's that scheduled for November. And again, the Raffles Hotel have been fantastic. They're giving us um, opportunities to, to roll it into next year. Uh, but again, if, they, if we can have London set up in a virtual platform that is successful, then it's something that we would absolutely look to do in, in the Asian um, arena as well. So how are things with the FFA University, Mike? It was uh, going to be later in the fall, something was scheduled. Are you going to be making some changes in the same way we are with the, the London and Singapore conferences? Yeah, I'm pretty optimistic that next week or the week after we'll get an announcement out that we will hold FFA University this year in the United States, uh, but on a virtual basis. So to, uh, to try to make it fit, we'll probably reduce the length of the session a little bit uh, and kind of hone it into kind of more of a lecture format. Uh, but we're going to do it with a conference provider that will enable Q&A and try to do what we can to make it as good of a production as we can. Uh, albeit not in person. Fantastic. And everyone's going to be aware of it and have the opportunity to send as many virtual attendees as possible, I'm assuming. So there's not going to be any headcount limits. So that's going to be the one good thing about not having a, a venue. Yeah, that's right. And obviously, I want to make the cost a lot more manageable for our, uh, our sponsors as well, since it's not an in-person event. And we'll, we'll save a fair amount of money on its delivery. And then uh, the Cayman Privates, the Cayman Private Funds Law has certainly been dominating conversation and transactions recently. How, is, how are registrations going in practice? Um, it's, a, it's a huge task. I won't, uh, I'll be honest with you, I won't lie. Um, so we have a 7th of August deadline. Um, the Maples Group as a whole, and sort of only within the market, we have in excess of 40,000 entities that we have to review together with clients to analyze who is a private fund or not, as the case may be. Um, so that, as you can imagine, is a mammoth task, but everybody is working diligently towards that, uh, that deadline. We actually have internally um, a specific support group for our funds lawyers who are, who are helping analyze all of those entities. The registration process has started, um, and there are hundreds of people who are already registered and applications and information has been gathered for some of the other private funds that have not yet registered. Um, all clients, as you would expect, are very aware of the deadlines and certainly some of the deadlines that have been brought forward by the contractual terms under the credit agreements. Um, but all of the clients are aware of that and there's very, very much all hands on deck approach being taken to get everybody, everybody working and the firms are working together as well, which is fantastic in, when it comes to interpretation of the laws and the deadlines and how we work with FEMA to make sure that it's as smooth as possible uh, when we run up to the deadline and hoping that um, it's not gonna be a 6th of August rush on that last day. Great, great. Well, Tina, thank you so much. It was great to have you. When we get uh, a little further on in the summer, maybe I'll have you back to give further updates as the London and Singapore conferences uh, get their game plan fully together. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. You're great, to, great to speak to you and I'd be happy to come back in the summer. Hey, I've also asked my partner Jeff Nagel to join us for a minute. Jeff represents the Alternative Reference Rate Committee uh, on the LIBOR transition for the Federal Reserve, as well as a number of our bank clients on their own LIBOR transition uh, endeavors. Jeff, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, so last week, uh, Art gave an update on best practices as to the LIBOR transition. Can you give everybody an update on what that's about? Sure, sure, sure thing. Um, you know, people have been, for the last couple of months, focused on COVID-19, uh, the economy, government programs, a lot of things that have been going on in the world. Uh, in the meantime, the LIBOR transition process is still continued to chug along. Uh, the UK's uh, FCA, the Financial uh, Conduct Authority, came out a few weeks ago and said that people should still expect LIBOR to end the end of 2021. So people should keep their eye on this, this looming reality of LIBOR transition coming up. So the, uh, the ARC came out uh, with an important document uh, last week. Uh, they came out with the best practice recommendations for LIBOR transition. Um, the recommendations are that. They're, they're recommendations, they're guidelines, they're not meant to be rules or regulations, but that being said, there's a lot of good information in there and financial market participants should uh, review those carefully. Um, 
the recommendations included uh, recommendations for a number of different products, including securitizations and floating rate notes and derivatives and consumer loans. Uh, but for purposes of this audience, I'll focus on business loans. Uh, there was a section about uh, uh, business loans in the recommendation. There are four concrete recommendations included. Uh, number one is that by September 30th of 2020, uh, the recommendation is for all loans to include the ARC's hardwired fallback approach. So that's, that's something new. Uh, many, most loans in the market today are using the amendment approach, but the, uh, the point there is to start using the hardwired approach. To that end, uh, we are working on an updated refresh of the hardwired approach to come out hopefully by the hey, end of June. Hey, Jeff, could you just give a one minute reminder refresher on the difference between the amendment approach and the hardwire approach? Sure, sure. So the both both approaches in the loan space um, have the same triggers for fallback. The big difference is what happens when LIBOR does cease. The amendment approach says the parties get together, they pick a new rate. Uh, sometimes there's borrower consent, sometimes there isn't, sometimes there's required lender consent, sometimes there isn't. Uh, the hardwired approach, on the other hand, takes a waterfall approach and says when LIBOR ceases, the replacement rate will be term SOFR if it's available. If not, then second step on the waterfall. If not, then third step. So a much more concrete explanation of what the rate will fall back to. Um, so so uh, financial market participants should look at that recommendation very carefully. Um, number two was a uh, recommendation that all vendors have their systems upgraded and up and running by September 30th. Uh, the vendors that I've been speaking with are working very hard on this. Uh, one of the gating items is having consistent uh, methodology and conventions across the market so that the vendors can build them correctly. Uh, the ARC working groups are, are working hard on those conventions and methodologies. Uh, number three is a big one, that there are no new LIBOR loans issued after June 30th, 2021. So about a, 13 months from now, that'll be it. No more, no more LIBOR loans to be issued in the market is the recommendation of ARC. Um, and number four is that if the contract does include any discretion as to the replacement rate, so the amendment approach, uh, the recommendation that the party with the discretion uh, reach out to their counterparty and inform them what the rate and spread will be at least six months before the transition goes effective. So giving the counterparty some forewarning as to what is coming. Uh, so those are the, those are the four uh, concrete recommendations and deadlines for loans. Um, in addition, in these recommendations from the ARC, there was a, uh, a page or two on best practices for institutions that included things such as governance and setting up uh, enterprise-wide LIBOR transition offices, um, strategy, um, monitoring, compliance, tax, regulatory. Uh, most of these are functions that, that many or most of our clients are already undertaking, but this is a pretty good checklist that the ARC put together as to what institutions should be doing. So, um, I think that the, the key takeaway here is, you know, these are, these are all recommendations, but there's something that it, it provides some concrete deadlines and examples of things that people should be doing. And, uh, you know, time, time tied and, and LIBOR transition wait for no man. So there's, there's no time like, like the present to, to make sure you're on the correct glide path for LIBOR transition. That's great. That's great. Appreciate the update. You also had an article in FFF this week about the loans aren't security case from the Southern District. Anything in that case for the funds finance market to focus on? Uh, what I would just say there is um, the, the decision came down as everyone in the loan market expected. Uh, it's been the wide held belief for, uh, you know, at least going on three decades now that loans are not securities dating back to the Revis case. Um, this case, uh, these, these cases pop up every once in a while where someone takes a shot at saying that loans are securities. 
uh, trying to get uh, some sort of recourse back to the back to the arranging bank. Um, this one came down, frankly, the way that everyone expected it to come down. Uh, it's good news. If it had been the you know if it had been the opposite, that would have been a sea change in the way bank loans were done across the U.S. So. Um, Kind of a, a bit of a non-story here. Um, this is what everyone was expecting, but um, you know, it's it's thank goodness it wasn't the opposite result because that would have been uh, that would have been a um, you know challenge for the market. Correct, correct. Well, Jeff, we always appreciate the great technical legal acumen uh, that you provide, contributing and supporting to our funds finance practice. Thanks, thanks for joining us today as well. Yep, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. So next, we're pleased to have with us Rory Smith, who's the founder of Brickfield Recruiting and pre-COVID had his fingerprints on a number of the career transitions that took place in the fund finance markets. Rory, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. Yeah, how are you holding up? Yeah, it's good. It's, uh, everything's a little bit slower as normal, but um, as you can imagine, you know, COVID is good family time, quality time that we're having here. And just, uh, just navigating through these choppy waters is... Uh, is, a, is fun in itself, so uh, doing well. Good, good. Well, you know, I really commend you. You know, you're one of the few people who both saw the opportunity uh, in fund finance and had the entrepreneurial moxie to take advantage of it. Uh, so, so, you know, good for you in terms of getting Brickfield founded and up and running. And I know things were going really, really well prior to COVID, but I assume hiring has to really have leveled off. How, how bad has the slowdown been? Yeah, absolutely. You're correct. Uh, prior to COVID, uh, the market was booming. Um, the fund finance industry sort of found their own feet as well, having a dedicated recruiter in the space who understood the market, who actually understood what they were looking for. So they didn't have to siphon through 50 odd CVs that they were getting through their traditional recruitment processes that normally the bank or the firm would have on their uh, panel. So for them, it was a, a bit of uh, fresh air. Um, but since COVID has hit, Things have tapered off um, a lot, um, just due to the nature that um, recruitment's quite a traditional process and face-to-face -face is a key aspect of recruitment. So rather than things being pulled, everything's sort of been on hold. So I would, I'd call it the big freeze has sort of come over us in the recruitment space. Um, we do have um, things still going on that we were working on pre-COVID. And they, of course, are continuing with those because they actually got through the face-to-face -face stages. Um, and then we've also got some, um, some clients that are still actively looking through some stuff as well. So um, I would say we're about sort of, we've, we've taken a good sort of 80% cut, really. Yeah, but there are still some active searches ongoing. Yeah, absolutely. So we're working with a few clients now. Um, what they've what they've identified is that A, they've identified that the, the personnel is needed for the fund finance group because the industry itself is still booming. Um, they're still very busy. So it's not like they don't need the, um, the, the, the individuals to join the team. Um, it's just what's happened is the, the big freeze has really come from a higher level and it's for all departments. So they can't cherry pick, but the fund finance team is in high demand. For, for still hiring for the people to, to, to work the uh, business that they've got. Um, but what some clients have seen is that they're working with the, the, uh, the online aspect at the moment because recruitment's quite a long process. You know, you're talking three months sort of from, from interviewing to hiring and you've got about three or four stages of interviews through that uh, process. So at the beginning, you're, you're looking at 10 or so, whatever it may be, candidates, and you can feel throughout that first interview, do they have the knowledge, are they who you're looking for, so on and so forth. So what some of the smart clients are doing is they're actively still moving forward with their hiring, taking it a little bit slower, but getting to the point that they're gonna be ready to action it right at the end when COVID lifts. So then they don't have to start going through the whole process again and wasting three months when they actually need the people to hit the ground running uh, when they're ready to go. In any difference in the hiring market on the legal side versus the banking side? So the legal side has been, uh, again, there are certain firms out there that needed these people before they were going into COVID. So those people have, of course, moved the uh, discussion up, up higher levels to make sure that they can still get that approved, and some of them have. Um, but then also a lot of firms are being very opt opportunistic um, about hiring because before coming into COVID, 
the supply of talent in the legal market was very low and very slim. So around the PQE3, PQE5 level, um, there's just not enough people in the market that are looking to move um, that, can, that can fill those shoes that other people need. So if today we were able to propose or were to propose a three PQE3 to PQE5, I know a lot of firms would snap those up pretty quick. Um, so it's more for the, I'd say the senior level of stuff where it's a lot more selective, a lot more decision needs to go behind it um, in the hiring process. But again, opportunistic hires are key at the moment. If someone stands out in the industry that they want, then they're gonna open up that dialogue and have those discussions for the hope that it will be ready to action post COVID um, to move things forward. In the banking space, um, still active there. Um, again, clients are just being a little bit more selective and not as aggressive as they were, is probably a good way to put it. Any difference between the hiring market in the US and in Europe? Yes, very much so. Um, the UK specifically has always been quite a choppy place um, to be hiring, uh, especially in the banking area, just due to Brexit always lingering. Um, it's, we always seem to get good news and then the market opens up and then something else comes, comes along. So um, last year, the UK market uh, for the banks was quite slow because Brexit and the negotiations that were going on. Once uh, that happened, then it opened up at the beginning of 2020. And then of course, COVID has come along and had that. And then of course, we've got Brexit again, discussions near the end of the year. So I'm expecting the UK to be quite a, quite a touch and go place at the moment, um, just in regards to not the fund finance teams per se, but just higher level decision making, coming to hiring and um, bringing on people to the, to the, to the bank um, itself. But active law firms all year has been very active. Brexit never hindered that. What, what are you hearing from employers as to when they might kind of reopen hiring in a more meaningful way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have sort of put the finger on September um, at the moment. Um, post, post summer, um, we're, we're expecting hopefully COVID and lockdown to lift sometime during the summer. Um, but we don't really see many offices calling back employees before, the, before uh, summer ends. So September is what we're expecting when things so-called get back to normal um, in that space. Now, how long that's gonna take to trickle down to the hiring side of things, we're not too sure. Um, and that's kind of what we're, what we're hoping for at the moment uh, here. Any advice for job candidates right now? <laughs> um, absolutely, I'd say stay, stay, stay active, um, get in touch. Um, what you wanna be is you wanna be at the forefront of when opportunities um, come up. Of course, here at Brickfield as well, um, we're very confidential when it comes to discussing with candidates and clients. So your CV, if it's with us, it won't be going anywhere else until you approve that. So we work on a no names basis when we're discussing with potential clients and so on and so forth, understanding what their business is, what they're looking to grow. And then once we get a better understanding of exactly the individual that they're looking for, is when we reach out to the suitable candidates to say, hey, this opportunity is available, what do you think? And give them a rundown and they have the, the balls are always in the candidate's court, court to decide where they want that CV to go, who they want to speak to, who they want to be introduced to. Great, great. Well, Roy, I really appreciate you uh, spending a couple minutes with us today. Good luck to you kind of getting through the disruption and, and moving into the new normal. Thanks. Yeah, no, no problem. Thank you very much, Mike. It's a pleasure being on, on the air. In these days when our businesses have material challenges and learn work from home, it can be easy to get focused on ourselves and forget how fortunate we still are compared to so many members of our community. And with that in mind today, we've been joined by Leslie Gordon, who's the CEO of the Food Bank of New York City, which is the largest hunger relief organization in the city. Leslie, thanks for joining us. Michael, it gives me such great pleasure to be joining you and all of your colleagues at Cadwallader this afternoon. Your firm has had such an incredible legacy of support for Food Bank for New York City, and, and by virtue of that, really for all of our New York neighbors across the five boroughs, for whom it's really important to be able to gain access to good nutritious food and other resources. Um, and so allow me to take this opportunity to give a big shout out to 
uh, all of your colleagues at Cadwallader for the time, talent, and treasure, and really deep investment over uh, a period that is decades long. And of course, I would be remiss if I also give a big shout out to uh, your partner, Larry Stromfeld, um, also a board member at Food Bank for New York City, um, who's just an incredible guy and has done such great service over many years to ensure that our neighbors have what they need to achieve what they want for themselves in their lives. That's great. That's mm -hmm. great. Tell us a little bit about the Food Bank's mission and what you guys are up to. But for context setting, Food Bank for New York City is one of the nation's largest uh, hunger relief organizations. We've been hard at work in New York City for more than 36 years. And we're at the, I like to tell people we're at the heart of a network of nearly a thousand on the ground partner organizations. And so those are food pantries where you can go to gain access to, to groceries, um, a community kitchen where you can gain access to a hot meal, uh, a senior center where you can gain access to, to one or the other and other resources, schools, uh, colleges, universities. And so specifically, we're serving every resident in New York City. So it's families, it's our older Americans, it's young people. And uh, to provide some context, we're on pace this year during COVID times to distribute nearly 90 million pounds of good nutritious food across the five boroughs of New York City. And um, when we think about New York City, the need is really significant. So about one in five New Yorkers doesn't always know when their next meal is coming from or what it will be. And we call that food insecurity. And there's lots of reasons that uh, our neighbors might find themselves accessing food at one of our nearly a thousand on the ground partners in New York City. Um, it could be short term lost wages, it could be unemployment, it could be long term unemployment, it could be an ongoing health issue, um, could be transportation, could be mental health. There's, there's lots of different reasons across a continuum that would cause people to find themselves accessing food online at a, a food pantry or a community kitchen. Um, and what's important, I think, to help folks who are watching this podcast appreciate and understand is really the depth and the breadth of the work that we do at Food Bank for New York City. And that is, is that we're not only focused on feeding people for today, but we're also strategically focused on ensuring that people have access to important resources that helps stabilize their lives and potentially push them to a greater place of self-sufficiency for the future. And so what does that look like? As an example, not only do we provide uh, the meals that I talked about earlier, we're also deeply invested in helping our New York neighbors connect to social benefits that they may be eligible for. And so that includes things like SNAP, we have a whole team that helps New Yorkers understand, am I eligible for uh, SNAP benefits, formerly called food stamps. Um, and so that helps put money into the pockets of our New York neighbors, which then provides them with an increased level of, of dignity to be able to go to a local uh, grocery store or bodega or any place else that SNAP dollars are accepted to make their own choices about what they and or their families really want um, and need to eat. Similarly, we have a, a team that works diligently around tax time every year to help those at uh, certain earning levels of income apply for and um, file their taxes. Um, and so that's what we call earned income tax credits. Together, those two programs help put roughly $110 million back into the pockets of our New York City neighbors on an annualized basis. And it really, again, gives them the purchasing power and increased levels of dignity to make choices on their own about what makes sense for them when it comes to food and other resources. What if somebody wanted to get involved and contribute? How, how could they find you and what would be some ways they could get engaged? 
Sure, so there's lots of really wonderful ways to get engaged at, at Food Bank for New York City, whether you're seven years old or 70 years old. Um, right now, in the time of COVID, we appreciate that folks may be sheltering in place. And so we've created lots of unique ways that people can get involved even at this time. Um, we have a campaign called Make a New Yorker Smile. It's our Dear New York letter writing campaign that invites you to um, share words of encouragement and hope with your neighbors um, who might be visiting and relying on food pantries or other food assistance programs. More than a thousand letters have already poured into us at Food Bank for New York City. And then we're sharing these letters at points of distribution all across the city, including our famous community kitchen on 116th Street in Harlem, where we normally turn out about five to 600 hot meals a day with uh, emphasis on seniors in particular. And so you can send those letters into us. Uh, you can learn more about it by visiting our website at foodbanknyc.org. If you're sheltering in place and you have kids or teens, we have a wonderful toolkit uh, that we can also send to you and your team at Cadwallader to send out to employees. It's our Spread Love Toolkit, and it helps kids and teens who are sheltering in place um, spread awareness through social media, to come up with uh, some fun ways to send in some artwork, and also to write letters and maybe even poetry, if, if that's a talent that they have, to let our New York neighbors know that they're loved and that we're thinking about them in this challenging time and, and really always. Oh, that's terrific, that's terrific. Leslie, thank you very much for you and your organization's good work and thanks a lot for visiting with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, and thanks so much to Cadwallader for just being um, an incredible support for so many years. Glad to be with you. In closing, uh, I would like to just mention that, you know, this has been a really tough week for a lot of us in the United States. Uh, a lot of the things we've seen on television have just been horrifying. It's been really hard for me personally. I'm sure even harder for many of my colleagues. It's been hard to be a parent. It's hard to know what to, uh, how to explain this to your kids when they walk in and you're watching CNN. Uh, my best thoughts, I do hope that we can all come together as a country. Uh, thank you all very much for listening. I hope uh, Industry Conversations was productive for you. We'd welcome your feedback on, on how we can make it more beneficial for your business and practice. Thanks a lot. The material and information contained in the podcast is for general informational purposes only. Any use of the audio within this podcast without the express consent of Cadwallader is prohibited. Quotes from this podcast may not be used without the express permission of the speaker.